So, we are here to discuss satisfaction and desire. 150 years ago, life was short and luxuries scarce. By comparison, ours is an affluent society where most have enough and plenty. Working class Victorian women had only one dress. Today, we have so many clothes that an average of 77% of our wardrobe is not worn in any one year, and half are never worn at all. Why then do so many of us remain unsatisfied, spending our lives feeling unfulfilled and chasing ever more? Is it nature to be dissatisfied with our lot in life? Do we need discontent to drive us to succeed and to innovate, to better our own lives and those around us? Or is our dissatisfaction a form of greed, encouraged by a relentlessly material culture that is not good for our own well-being and that of the planet? And should we, as a result, engage in a radical overhaul in our goals and values? With me to discuss this today are four wonderful speakers. We've got Guy Standing to my right. He's an economist. He's most widely known for his work on universal basic income, which I'm sure you've heard lots about. He's currently working with the Labour Shadow Chancellor, John McDonnell, on plans to rule this out in the United Kingdom. He's the author of too many best-selling books to mention, but most recently, Plunder of the Commons, a manifesto for sharing wealth. Also to my right, we have Mark Littlewood. He's a libertarian economist, so obviously we're going to have a good fight to my right over here. A libertarian economist who believes that if you don't enjoy the materialism of society today, you have the option to go and live in a cave if you wish. <laughs> he is the director general of the Institute of Economic Affairs and features regularly on BBC Question Time, Newsnight, Sky News, and the Today program. To my left, we've got Isabella Kaminska, who comes to economics by way of ancient history, which she studied at UCL. She's now editor of FT Alphaville, a daily news and commentary service for the financial markets professionals created by the Financial Times. And he needs no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyways, because nothing makes a British person squirm more than being praised in public. <laughs> Commonly described as one of popular music's most innovative figures, Brian Eno is a musician, record producer, visual artist, and theorist, best known for his pioneering work in ambient music and contributions to rock, pop, and electronica. Earlier this year, Brian Eno was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So. So. Does the success of the economy depend on desire and greed? Guy Standing, the floor is yours. Well, I find the question actually almost impossible to answer, so I should actually shut up at this point. <laughs> but, I, but I do want to make a few points that relate to it. This sense of constant dissatisfaction is something that we know exists quite commonly, but we must take a class perspective on these issues. Some people have the luxury of being able to have all these shorts and dresses and things in their wardrobe that are mentioned in the preamble. But if you're in the precariat today, just let me give you one statistic which is their reality. One in every three people who are in rented accommodation today in this country, when they've paid their rent and they've paid their food, have only 23 pounds left for everything else they have to spend. These people are living on the breadline with debts that are basically unsustainable. We have higher personal debt today than at any time in our history. It's worth 87% of GDP. So you've got a growing precariat and the homeless and rough sleepers who are being subject to insecurity. And at the same time, we have a situation where we need a new politics of time. Every age has had its stupidity about what is work and what is not work. Our age is the most stupid in history. <laughs> Arthur Pigou, an economist, I'm an economist, Arthur Pigou famously said that if he'd hired a woman as a housekeeper, 
or a cook. National income went up, economic growth went up, employment went up, the unemployment rate went down. And then if he married her and she continued to do precisely the same work, national income went down, economic growth went down, employment went down, and the unemployment rate went up. And we still suffer from having labor statistics which give a completely distorted picture of how people have to live. And if you're in the precariat, you have to do a hell of a lot of work for labor, work for the state, work for filling in forms, work for applying for benefits or dealing with sanctions or all sorts of other things, filling in your resume for the 39th time. People are under pressure and stress. And we need to capture a different way of life. And one of the simplest things that we could do is overhaul our labor statistics so we have a better picture of how people are being forced to behave. Because we have an epidemic of stress, of dissatisfied people who are feeling they have no time. I call them the must-be-somewhere-else generation. We've all qualified with, for an MBSE degree. You don't feel you are content with doing it. And it reminds me of the ancient Greeks and the ancient aphorisms that went at the time. Cato famously said, never is a man more active than when he's doing nothing. And Henri Toro in the 19th century who when he went to live in a cabin, he said, my greatest gift is for want so little. We have to have a new approach which enables us to be lazy. Aristotle regarded a civilized person as someone who had access to urgia, laziness. We puritanical people have turned laziness into some sort of crime. The politicians say, oh, he's lazy. As if laziness is some parasitic activity. We need laziness. And we only, if we have control of our time, will we learn to live differently, learn to smell the roses, learn to appreciate the butterflies, learn to get reconnected with nature. Reread Alexander von Humboldt from the 19th century to see that connectivity. And only then can we deal with the billboards that shout at us to spend and spend and spend. I've just been in Warsaw, and there is nothing more annoying than seeing a 30 square meter billboard in the center of Warsaw showing Rafa Nadal in his underpants. <laughs> Telling us we must buy those underpants and we will look like Rafa Nadal. We are subject to a loss of our landscape commons. Those billboards and ad advertisements telling us that we're inadequate, we need more, we need more, we need more. Well, we need to get rid of that crap. And I think we've got to realize that only if we can slow down, only if we can get a control of our time so that we can care for one another, the care work we do, not in the statistics, we need to have a different perspective on life, and then we will want less. That's what I hope. Um, Mark, and a basic over to you. Will help. <laughs> so, three, three brisk minutes. Uh, well, I, I, I was surprised to hear that um, politicians keep denouncing us as lazy and idle and the rest of it. I actually get a bit frustrated because all I ever hear from politicians when they are describing uh, families or nurses or people in the military are hard-working families. Apparently this is now a mandatory adjective to put in front of everybody. Uh, you know, we're on the side of hard-working families. Politicians across the spectrum say this. I've never decided who to vote for because I don't know who's standing up for idle single people like myself. Um, <laughs> nobody's making a pitch. People like you who get out of bed late and don't really work very hard. Who's standing up? They're all the opposite. They're all telling us how hard we are working. And they're not... I dare say there are lots of people who work very hard. Um, I've actually decided what I want in my life is to lower my number of hours 
per week. I have enough sort of material stuff. I still want more. But the, the question we were asked was, um, are we permanently, is, human nature, is it human nature to be dissatisfied or is it encouraged by a relentless material culture? And I think the answer to that question is both. But, I'm, but I think I'm probably in favour of both. I think human dissatisfaction is probably a good thing. I don't mean human misery. I mean striving for better than you have. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.